Chow. Uh, Josh Parnell, he's from Phoenix Park and Rec. And he's going to give a presentation about uh, heat related issues and hiking and how to hike safely. Uh, so, as you know, we have uh, Camelback that draws a lot of traffic and we have a lot of uh, rescues and that kind of stuff down there due to the heat. So Phoenix has been working for about a year, a little over a year on closing trails when it gets too hot. And uh, Josh is going to go into that a little bit. So welcome, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so yes, my name is Josh Parnell. I am uh, as uh, the chief said, I'm with the City of Phoenix Parks and Rec Department. Actually, I'm with the Natural Resources Division. And so my charge is some of our <coughs> preserve areas. So I have Papago, uh, Camelback Mountain, Piestua, and Drinky Trough. And so, which just happens to be three of our busiest trails in the system. But anyhow, oh, there you go. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the developments that are happening in Troya Trail sort of an update, what's going on in ECHO, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about our excessive heat closures. <coughs> so uh, it's hard to see, but that top road there is Troya Lane. Our original access point for the Troya Trail was off of Troya Lane, which you can imagine those residents that lived around uh, the road there could see upwards of 12,000 people a week walking right in front of their houses and so the community came together um actually it's happened many times over the years they came together but this time there was some a little bit more movement that happened and so the right people were at the right time at the right table and they were able to come up with an agreement between uh Kaney, i'm sorry not Kaney, uh the phoenician post development which is the group that are putting in uh houses here on this side and they agree with the city to put in a trail easement. And that trail easement is still owned by uh, Host, which is the developer, but they're allowing the city of Phoenix to put in a trailhead there. And so the trail access was there on Troya. It is now going to be all the way at Interporta. And so there will be no walking in front of people's houses. It will actually be an interim point right there off of Interporta. The trailhead itself, um, there isn't many amenities to it, but there is going to be a restroom and a fountain, which uh, is fantastic. For those that have you piped trail trail before, there was nothing there before but a bike rack. Um, so the restrooms were actually the original restrooms that were there as part of the golf course. Um, so plumbing didn't have to be changed. What we did is we capped it with uh, some gavians. I'll show some pictures of that. It blends in nicely with the um, rest of the surroundings. We went in and put in a bunch of trees. That's actually what they're doing this week. Uh, the whole <laughs> idea is that the trail itself will be screened as much as possible from the new development, as well as from the development that was already existing here uh, before. As you can imagine, the houses that are there on the south side, they used to look into a beautiful golf course and they probably purchased their lots to be on a golf course, but as development happened, uh, the finishing got rid of some of the area there, and now host is going to be de developing it. There's a little bit of a conflict, but we've been working with the community and the HOA there to hopefully come up with a solution that they're happy with, and that's mostly going to be additional uh, vegetation. So some of the pictures there, um, as I talked about we have the Phoenician in play, we have host development, and we have this little tiny easement. The easement is only 25 feet wide, and we had to snake between property owners, uh, personal property owners, the Phoenician, the host, and so the trail itself has changed a little. Um, if we had our druthers, we wouldn't have designed the trail this way, but we had to just to accommodate the uh, easement. And so there's going to be three banks of stairs that weren't there before. Um, this is where the existing, we're butting up against the existing trail. And then from that point down, you're going to see where we did some development of actually put in some really beautiful uh, stairs and retaining walls. Um, the stone works actually fantastic. It looks as though and our uh, design was to match a uh, stone work that the CCC did and some of our other developed parks within the city as well as all over the state. And so it, it came real close to matching that. 
But as you can see, the you know, developed uh, trail goes up these steps. We are going to put in some railing to help people up the steps, but also to keep people from cross-cutting from one switch back to the other. Mm -hmm. um, it's a weird phenomenon that we get. People go to exercise, <laughs> but they want the shortest path possible to exercise. <laughs> and so, I mean, you'll see it at the parking lot, but we'll cut a trail through, you know, same thing there on the trail. So we're gonna put out some uh, um, railing that will hopefully keep people from do that. And we use mother nature. We've planted a ton of cactus and relocated it from other areas. The more cactus we put, the more people stay on the trail. Um, so there is a huge retention basin that's on the mountain side of the development. Um, as you know, water comes down from mountains. We need to have a place for it to gather so it can slow down speed as before it goes through the already existing uh, drainage. They were planting trees yesterday. Um, the bathroom, you can sort of see the gradients there on the left. It will have three stalls, they're unisex stalls, um, the individually locked, and then there's a shared area to wash your hands. On the other side of the uh, sink area is where the sink, I mean, the fountain will go, and then we'll also have a bike rack. So a little update, as I talked about during a busy week, we can have upwards of 12,000 people on Choya and 12,000 people on Echo. So we're talking about you know, 24,000 people during a week on one mountain. That being said, um, so the average is you know, 6,500 a week. That being said, we only average 1.7 rescues a week. For the amount of people that are on the mountain, that's less than 2%. So it's actually 0.2% of the people on the trail here need to get rescued. 90% of our rescues are twisted ankles, rolled knees, um, things that are hard to avoid. What happens during the summer, though, is everything gets elevated. So a person who twists their ankle, which normally could walk down maybe with the help of a friend in the heat, 15 minutes later can be something more severe. I imagine a lot of you heard about the crazy week we had last week with the 15 individuals that were up there that led to nine people being rescued, six being uh, flown off the mountain. Yeah, it was a crazy day. There was probably 100 plus firefighters. We had triage tents. We had recovery tents. It was, it was a zoo, but um, it happens. Uh, Phoenix, one of the questions that was asked earlier is, do we charge for that? City of Phoenix Fire Department prefers not to have any stupid hiker laws or charge for anything. Their rationale is a individual who has a twisted ankle would be hesitant to call 911 and it goes from a twisted ankle to a heat related uh, injury and it becomes more severe. So they would rather the person call 911 at the earliest point so they can get them off the mountain and safe before it becomes something traumatic. Um, we've already had three fatalities on our mountains this year. Um, two of them were on 40th Street, the trailhead there that's just um, uh, 40th Street dead ends into it on the south side of Piestro. And then we had one at South Mount. So a little update um, about Echo Trailhead. I'm sure all of you are aware it is a busy, popular place. Our biggest issues there, um, besides the rescues, is um, lack of parking. Uh, about 10 years ago, the city redid the parking and tripled the amount of parking spaces that were there. Well, if we had increased it by tenfold, there would still be people waiting to get in. So right now we have 100 spaces and they fill up most mornings during a beautiful time of the year. They'll fill up and be filled up until noon, um, maybe even past this time of year. They still get full. The parking lot gets closed down early in the morning. Just don't have enough spaces. When we do close the parking lot, it creates traffic issues everywhere else. So if you look up at that red circle, that's the entrance to uh, the trailhead. And that's where that roundabout is. When the parking lot's full, to keep people from cycling around and causing a traffic jam within the trailhead, we close the parking lot. So then people will, at times, park there or wait there, and it creates a traffic jam now at the roundabout. So during the busier seasons from um, 
Thanksgiving up through the end of March, we hire off-duty police officers on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to help us with that traffic flow. What we are proposing to do and working to do is part of that issue is people don't understand why the gates close. And so we're in the process of purchasing some electronic billboard signs that will go at the trailhead and replace a couple of the signs that are already there. Um, they will only run during the open hours of the trailhead. And so when the trailhead closes at sunset, the lights of the sign will go off as well. But it will be able to be changed the message instantly from the staff there in the field. They can have the message say closed for rescue, parking lot full, um, heat, excessive heat day, trails are closed or whatever that message needs to be. Any questions so far, either about Choi or about Echo? So um, one of the issues that we face at both Choya and we face at Echo is uh, shared rides. They're great, but then they also come with a challenge. It's wonderful that they can come and people can be dropped off. That's one less vehicle that we need to worry about parking for. But it also creates some issues with traffic flow. And so on the Choya side, we are looking to take some of the parking spaces that are along Intercordon and label them as just drop-off spots. Mm. Um, as they are drop-off spots during a rescue, they will also become fire um, places for them to park their apparatuses for rescues. So we see that being a win on two fronts. Of course, the third side is, and the challenge is, now we've taken away some parking spaces that we have very limited amount along Intercord and anyhow. So we're, we're gonna have to work through that. Um, I'm meeting with uh, police in the field uh, next week for us to, I mean, not police, fire for us to be able to figure out that solution. Um, Echo, we are looking at some possibilities, uh, working in partnership with uh, Paradise Valley of possibly having some places that would allow for drop off on the roadway before they actually get to the trailhead. And so hopefully we can have some updates and information on that in the next few months. Hey Josh, I've got a yeah. question from uh, one of our attendees. When is the expected timeline for the Toyota Trail? So up the trailhead is supposed to open this summer. We, as the city of Phoenix and our contractor, are right on pace with that open date. The <laughs> development that we're working in parallel to host development um, they have changed some of their plans. And so we haven't quite figured out how their schedule is going to finish aligning with our schedule. So some challenges have come up in the last few weeks. Uh, hopefully this week I can have an answer um, as to what it looks like. But as of today, we still plan to open the summer. There may be some delays, but as of today, it's the summer. I know that's a non-answer, but that's the right answer. Thank you. So City of Phoenix um, last summer, started a temporary pilot program for excessive, excessive heat closures. So about this time last year, went to Parks Board, and we began a study of what it would look like to close our three, three of our hardest trails during excessive heat days. Mm -hmm. And so that happens to be all of Camelback Mountain and Paiesua Peak. So, the pilot program last summer was going to be for 77 days. Of those 77 days, we only had eight days that it was closed. So you may ask, um, what, how do we come up with these closure days? So the first thing we do is we use the National Weather Service. <laughs> and when they issue a heat watch, and a heat watch is, they use a magic formula that I don't understand. It includes temperature, humidity, uh, cloud cover, uh, winds. They use about 27 different factors that they come up with this formula that will tell us whether or not it is not healthy to be outside during these heat events. And so when they issue a excessive heat watch, we will communicate using our PIO office, emails. Um, we send it out to all the media to try to get the word out that we may be closing our trailheads. If it goes from a heat watch to an excessive heat warning, then that triggers the next level where we say we are going to close our trails on these days. So for example, this weekend, we are looking at possibly a heat 
watch. And so Friday and Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have potential for that. So when the National Forest or the National Weather Service says it's we have a heat watch, we will send out communication. If it gets elevated to that excessive heat warning, then we will close the trails. And trails end up being closed, those three trails from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. I will tell you that we are finding that although we're closing during the hottest part of the trail, because we don't start until 11 a.m., most people have been on the trail since 7 a.m. Um, the individuals that got rescued last week, although it wasn't an excessive heat watch day, um, they were on the trail at 7 a.m. The rescue didn't come out until 1045. And so people who are out hiking in the heat, they think they can get back in time, but it gets real hot real quick, and then they have to deal with the consequences. And so um, at the end of this summer, we're making a recommendation to Parks Board that we actually will close the trails for the entire day. Uh, I don't know where that will go because it will depend on how the community supports it. All right, so uh, going back to Heat Watch, that's when they have a 50% confidence um, that there's gonna be heat danger and then it goes to an excessive heat warning at 80%. Excuse me? Yes. Define community. So, um, those that would show up at the Parks Board, our City of Phoenix Parks Board meeting, voice their opinions, those that have voiced their opinion through their city council. Um, everything's open for public debate. And so the Parks Board is typically led by the wills of the community. And so those that speak up typically are the ones that are right. Rather than close it the whole day when you think it's gonna be excessive heat, how about some sort of early morning warning? You know, yeah. today looks like it's going to be, you know, bad. So get up and get down. So yeah. at Echo, um, we have a ranger there from the moment it opens to the moment it closes. <coughs> and we have them there to educate people. So we get a good amount of regulars that um, bodies are more in tune to hiking in the heat. They go up the, down the trail, no problem. Um, the rangers at the trailhead try to educate. They, you know, look at individuals. If they're wearing flip-flops, they're probably not ready to hike. If they have a little four ounce bottle that they got at the resort on their way out, they're probably not ready to hike. And so they engage with them in a conversation um, about making good choices. And, you know, we use what we try to teach is take a hike, do it right. And so we have these certain, actually, there's a flyer there for um, things that we look for, if they're dressed correctly, if they have a way to communicate, if they have water, if they have shade, things like that. And so we try to engage and educate at that level. Most of the time, we encourage people to go up to the first lookout and come back down. Uh, but some people are very persistent and stubborn, and they will go as far as they think that they want to go. Campbellback Mountain is beautiful. We love it. It is a breathtaking uh, part of our city. People will come from all over just for that opportunity to hike it. They will get off the plane from the Midwest or, you know, wherever it was cool to get here. The heat hits them in the face, but they still drive the rental car straight over to Echo and try to go hiking. And so we do our best to educate. Uh, part of that education is we've been doing a concierge education program for the last few months. We've actually made all, hit all the resorts here in PV, as well as a lot of the surrounding res resorts, met with their concierge staff, their front desk staff, um, and we try to educate them on other trails that aren't as strenuous, um, other things to talk about with their guests with or places that they can send them. Um, we've also reached out to uh, visit Phoenix and ex Scotts Experience Scottsdale, which are, uh, they work with uh, corporate groups. They bring people into the Valley. And so they've been sharing that message as well. Our PIO staff has been wonderful this year and providing printed material and stuff that's gone out to the public. So hopefully we're making that impact um, education wise, but still people choose to do what they want to do. Sir. So there are organizations that provide like organized guided hikes, so people just don't sure. come up on their own. So um, City of Phoenix, we do have some guided hikes. They're not on a regular basis. And so we provide those. There are several outfits in Scottsdale that um, people can hire, and they will do guided hikes as well. Um, the city, we do not, Phoenix, city of Phoenix, we do not charge for any outside group to come in and use our facilities or our trailheads. And so there are businesses that do that. Um, 
The only rule we ask is that they don't exchange money on property. Any other questions so far? So this is just some of the information that comes out that we send out what those expected dates are. Um, the easiest way to find out when we're gonna have these closure dates is you can actually sign up for an email and I'll show the little QR code. You're welcome to scan it. I also have it over here. But what it does is once you sign up for it, it takes you 10 seconds. You write your name and your email. When we generated this message, we press send, it gets out to you or whoever signs up for it and they know when we're gonna close the trails these days. This is what it looks like when we close the trails, gates go down, rangers stand there. And uh, we got the sign to jump. Well, I have a question. Excuse yep. me. Is that the same thing as so we get text messages from the Paradise Alley Police? Certain things. Is it that? No, this would be through the City of Phoenix through our uh, Take a Hike program. Take a Hike, Do It Right program. So it would be a separate text from email. Do you text the Paradise Alley Police? I haven't. I, I mean, really, we've just uh, we'll communicate through an email, but we haven't to this point. Oh, I mean, that'd be helpful because I see those texts. Yeah, on the I'm sure there's a way we could arrange that. Uh, so why did we pick Camelback and Fiesta? Well, there are busiest trails out of town. People come during that time and fire. It's most difficult for them to rescue, especially from the echo side. For those of you that have hiked Echo, it's not really a hike, it's more of a mountain scramble. And yep. it's a very short trail, but it's a very steep trail. Um, so there was actually some success last year with the excessive heat closures. So we didn't start closing it until the 16th. So if you look at April 30th through um, July 15th, those were the amount of rescues we had, 34. And then if you look at the hotter months that were actually from July 16th through September 30th, we only had 21 rescues. So that was a 38% reduction. Good. Um, we have 215 other miles of trails that are still open. The only three trails we're calling, closing are on Camelback and Piesla, and they happen to be very small trail, uh, short trails. As I said, it closes from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you're interested, you can take a picture of the QR code. I also have a few there. And then you'll sign, you can sign up directly there for your email. And then the information will come out to you. That's all I have. Are there any other questions for me? That was easy. Are yes, the concierge people told to look to see if they have water when they leave? Yes. Yeah, so we see we, a lot. A lot of them coming from motels that don't have any. So part of the presentation we gave is yeah. we talked about what to look for, people prepared. Um, we did give them, you know, the checklist of what to look for. But when you do engage, make sure that they understand that they need to drink water before they're on the trail, have tons of water on the trail. Mm -hmm. When individuals are half done with the water, then you really should be turning home back. And so we try to, you know, hit that through with them as well. But really, I think the key is having them provide alternative hikes. And so there we gave each of the concierge a list of 10 alternative hikes um, that are not as strenuous. Some of them are in the shade um, and they're much more family friendly. And so we try to encourage that as well. But for whatever reason, um, we've seen a huge increase. And I guess it's Scottsdale and PV are probably experiencing this bachelorette parties. Huh. Apparently, it is a thing where bachelorette parties, the bride comes dressed in her white out, uh, hiking oh outfit, gosh. and then she has the 10 <coughs> ladies behind her that are all in their black outfits, and they go. And I will kid you not, on a Friday or Saturday, we may have 10 different bachelorette wow. groups hiking up Echo. Yeah. So I assume it's to go get their workout before the party for the rest of the weekend. That would be my guess. Anyway. It's a weird phenomenon that we've seen. Any other questions? We got another one here uh, from Steve is what is the policy to charge or not charge for services taking hikers off the mountain? And are there any changes to the policy that is recommended? So currently there is no policy. And as I uh, mentioned before, the fire department has been pretty clear that they wouldn't support any kind of charging. Their fear is that a rescue will go from a simple 
walk down or basket down uh, rescue to something more severe if a person chooses not to call 911 because they're afraid of a penalty. With that being said, if a person does something that is out of our normal rules, uh, off trail, um, goes into a closed area that is not approved for hiking, we can find them for not following city code, but it wouldn't really be that they were fined based on the rescue. Okay. Thank you. Um, what about those hikers where they, there's a small group of them or something, and one person says, I'm really tired, I'm just going to sit here and wait, and the other people go on? Isn't that kind of dangerous? Because the person sitting there waiting, don't know what's going to happen to them, and they might get up and try to walk down? And... Absolutely. Um, we always encourage people to stay, um, not to hike by themselves or stay by themselves, but to be in at least a small group. And so if that larger group split up, we would always encourage somebody to stay with the other person, maybe to start walking them down. Um, we are very fortunate that our local hikers and our hikers that are on the trail almost every day, they are the best eyes and ears. They look out for people on the trail. They report the information right back down to the ranger that then can set up rescue or um, mobilize fire to show up. Um, for example, the rescue with those same, um, with the prayer group last week, it all started, was generated by a regular hiker coming in and reporting what they could see. And so that's where it went from there. I'm sorry, one more question. How sure. would someone call the ranger? So if they, we had the ranger posted at Echo. So there's somebody down there for them to talk to. There are phone numbers that they can call directly at our trailheads if oh. there isn't a ranger there. Of course, they can call 911 and that also dispatches. Sir? Have you, I mean, it sounds great because it's the bottom of the trailhead. So you thought about, in the discreet sign as you go up the trailhead. I, this is crazy, almost like Burma Shea signs. You know, everybody remembers what Burma Shea signs were in the poems because you're almost to die, to die, to die, to die. Okay. Well, it's, it's still, if you have a, have a problem, dial this number. Yeah. I, That's a great idea. I, I'm open to it completely. We've actually been, um, so if you go up back though, you have the lookout that looks over PV. The next lookout is sort of the saddle on the mm -hmm. hump. Um, we've encouraged, I think we're gonna put a sign there. My plan is to put a sign there. That's, we'll say, congratulations, you made it to such and such lookout with the idea that people wanna have the selfie of what they did. And that might be a great place for them to take the selfie that they can feel accomplished and not go up the next section. So. I agree, but each of those steps, we could have that communication. Yeah. Ma'am? Is there anyone, or, or does anyone walk up and down carrying water and give this to people who need it? Yes. So we have a handful of regular hikers that that's sort of their mission. Uh, they load up, they pay for it out of their own pocket. Um, it is part of their workout. So they go from where, you know, they're carrying a backpack with 30 pounds of water in it. And if they see people, they hand out water the whole way up. Yeah, and then the rangers themselves will carry. Typically, our rangers run the trail. They'll have some water with them. They have some ice packs that you know yeah. that they can break into. They carry an umbrella that they can provide shade for somebody. Uh, they have a piece of ground covering so they can put it on the rock so it keeps the radiant heat from bothering the individual. Um, most of our rangers also are uh, wilderness first survivor, um, first aid trained, and so they start providing basic first aid and assessing the um, victim until fire can get there. So the role the park ranger has with fire is our fire department leads our rescues, but we can be the conduit of finding the individual, performing basic first aid, assessing the uh, victim until fire can get there because it takes the phone call for them to get to 911, for them, that, them to, get in the rigs to get to the trail. So there's some time lapse. And so our rangers who are already on staff there at the location can get to the individual and start that rescue process before fire gets there. One neat thing about um, fire is they are rolling out a drone program. We as a park rangers have been wanting to have it for years and it finally has gotten the support and momentum within the city of Phoenix. And so that rescue last week was the first time it was deployed. Um, imagine being able to be at the trailhead, 
throw this drone up in the air. It can fly automatically where the route is. It's predetermined in the unit itself. They can find the individual within moments, uh, mark their location, and then send the fire crews there. Because a lot of the delay sometimes is finding the individual. So we as a parks department are gonna be an early adapter into the program and we're also gonna have drones. But our drones we're gonna use much more for maintenance, being able to survey our trails, see what kind of degradation has happened over the years, find the spots that we need to send our uh, volunteer crews out and our staff crews to work on. Um, and other parts of the city, we have a large transient population that camp in our uh, preserves, which is illegal. And so we can use the drones to help us find those individuals. Um, <coughs> instead of having a staff person hike back and forth for miles a day, we can uh, be a lot more efficient at that. So I definitely think that us adopting this technology is going to help us in rescues in some other areas as well. Any other questions? Okay. A little off topic here. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, as I said, I have some handouts there. On the back side of that little one is the little QR code if it didn't work on the screen. We'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate your time today. Hey, uh, just in addition to uh, heat related issues, always on my heart is uh, drowning prevention. So make sure you're watching your kids and your grandkids around water. Uh, we've had over, we've had four near drownings in Paradise Valley, in Paradise Valley in the last year. Uh, so this is not a, this is not a Phoenix. This is not a Scottsdale problem. This is a Paradise Valley problem as well. Um, you see uh, 13, 15 year old kids drowning as well. Uh, so keep an eye on kids around water. If you're hosting as a grandparent, you have a great pool, you have a uh, lazy river, you have a great backyard that you wanna share with your grandkids for their birthday, please hire a lifeguard in order to take care of them when they're uh, doing it because you will get distracted. Your phone will distract you. Your aunt will distract you. Your neighbor will distract you. Somebody's going to distract you and that's when drowning occurs. So hire somebody to watch your kids when you're hosting a party.